This video is sponsored by Honey. How many years did your dad get when you got locked up? They gave him um, life, but he's looking good for his case on the peel back, so he will be turning the streets again. I'm hold, I'm hold, I'm holding down to you get You know Lil Durk, the 28-year-old megastar who's currently running the rap game in 2021? But do you know his 52-year-old father, Big Durk, who used to run the dope game in Chicago back in the 90s? And then of course there's his 40-year-old cousin, Medium Durk, who I just made up. But really though, in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the insane story of Lil Durk's father, Big Durk, real name Dante Banks, who back in the 90s was a genuine Chicago dope kingpin, running an operation that at its peak reportedly moved a a whopping 85 kilos of pure dope through the streets of Chicago. With Big Dirk's operation racking up millions of dollars in cash and cementing Big Dirk as one of the most prolific gangster disciples that Chicago had ever seen. In fact, Big Dirk's exploits on the block were so prolific that he even ended up on the radar of the founder of the GDs, Mr. Larry Hoover himself. And when you start looking at Big Dirk's dope empire, you might just find yourself looking at Lil Dirk's musical empire a little bit differently. So we're gonna get into all of that, but first, a Quick word from our sponsor, Honey. Sometimes you save, sometimes you don't. You need a promo code from Honey. Honey's the number one shopping tool in America, bro. Shout out to Honey, yeah, Honey. It's that little button at the top of your browser that follows you around the net, saving you money. It's funny how it automatically searches for promo codes so you don't have to, that's lucky. Say you want some new kicks for the low. Hit that Honey button, bro, and watch it bring you the best coupon codes. We all love free savings, dog. Say you need a new PC for gaming, dog. If you're buying it already, why not slap on Honey and save yourself plenty and prevent your wallet from always being empty? Because when it comes to cash, I'm always petty. So hit the link in description and save yourself some pennies. Add it to your browser for free and join honey.com slash traplawross. Click that link in description because supporting Honey is supporting me. And hell, why not support yourself with some savings, dog? That's joinhoney.com slash traplawross. Thanks, Honey, for supporting this video and thank you for supporting Honey. I'm out. Now, understandably, Big Dirk hasn't done a lot of press or media over the course of his life. I learned a lot of background information about him from his excellent interview with Cred Talks on the Chicago Cred YouTube channel. That video is well worth a watch in its entirety. I suggest you go and check it out in your own time. And while we're on the topic, Chicago Cred are an amazing organization aiming to reduce gun violence in the city of Chicago through street outreach, coaching, counseling, workforce development, advocacy, and prevention. I think they're doing a really amazing thing, and I just want to highlight that organization before we get further into this video, and also because I'm going to be referencing their interview with Big Dirk quite a lot in this video. Anywho, Big Dirk grew up tough in the mean streets of Inglewood in Chicago. His mother was unfortunately hooked on dope when he was young, with his family eventually becoming homeless. With nine siblings, including several older brothers who were locked up when he was a child, he found himself becoming the man of the house at around only 12 years old. Because to see your mother on drugs, you know, it's a hard thing as a youngster. She had 10 children. You know, my older brother's being locked up. This this is a family that um, no stranger to the penal system. So they was locked up. So they kind of at a young age, we talking 12, 13, you got to stand up and be the man in the house and uh, watch over your mama. And Big Dirk truly did have to man up. Being a young man coming up tough in the mean streets of Chicago's Englewood can't have been easy. But in the same breath, Big Dirk was able to navigate these mean streets well because in his own words, the danger in the area was also a source of excitement for him growing up. Coming up in Englewood was hard and exciting at the same time. You seeing all the hustlers, you seeing the women of the night, you seeing the um, guys gambling, you, you got the after hour joints, you got a lot of things things going on out there. Because I knew if I sit there and watch them long enough, it was just like TV. Someone in the end gonna get shot, someone gonna get stabbed, someone gonna get whooped, because in the end, someone is gonna be cheap. So a teenage Dante Banks was quickly becoming an expert in all things street in Inglewood. But eventually, the day would come where he would have to hop off the porch and get into the game himself. And thankfully, he had a female cousin in the dope game that was able to put him on at a young age. He secured his first pack, which he says turned him into a man, and it was this moment when he transformed from Dante Banks into Big Dirt. I went to her and said, I need some work. She gave me an eight ball. And I took that eight ball from Dante Banks to what you know right now to be Big Dirt. So Big Dirk was in the game, simply beginning as a small time slanger on the corner, but deep down, 
Big Dirk knew that he was a natural born leader. And even all of his peers in school knew that he was the one moving big time dope at a young age. And so with that reputation, it didn't take long for the big gangsters in the area to eventually hear about what he was up to. And apparently the gangster disciples or GDs that ran the area would go into local high schools and see which kids were moving the most work. Lining up the young dope boys and picking the most serious ones to enter the organizational structure of the GDs. With these experience being Big Dirk's first entry point into the underworld of Chicago gangs. So they sent a guy up to Robeson, up to the high school. This is the head GDs, right? At the time, I don't know nothing about them. And he said, hey man, I'm around here and I want to know from around here, we want to organize this area here and we want to know who is the most influential guy amongst y'all. And they all said, Dirk and Bible. And then Bible said, well, I don't have much influence. And they told me that um, they wanted me to um, be the shot caller for that neighborhood. So Dirk was put on as the shot caller of his neighborhood, quickly rising up the ranks of Chicago's feared gangster disciples. And at a certain point, Big Dirk said that he had gotten so far in the dope game that he couldn't continue running things at this level of seriousness without getting an opportunity to meet the man at the very top. We're talking about the leader and founder of the gangster disciples, Larry Hoover. Now, if you watched my earlier video about about the origins of the Black Disciples and Gangster Disciples in Chicago, then you'll know that despite getting locked up in the 70s and being sentenced to over 150 years in prison for murder, for decades, Larry Hoover continued to run the GD empire from behind the wall. And Big Dirk explained that he was moving up in the ranks of the GD so fast that the senior members of the gang approved his request to meet Larry Hoover in person. So Big Dirk would go and visit him personally in jail and begin to build a relationship with the mythical mastermind at the very top of the food chain. So they said, okay, and they set up the meeting and I got a chance to meet them and we clicked on from then on, you know, it was a beautiful relationship. But when you see him, he's humble, he's meek, he's intelligent. You know, this is this is talent being wasted in here, man. So Big Dirk was truly connected. A high ranking GD with a personal relationship with Larry Hoover, a reputation that rang heavy in the streets of Chicago and a dope slang and operation that was apparently booming 24 seven, seven days a week. The money was coming in fast and Big Dirk was truly living the high life. In fact, many years later, his son Lil Dirk would say himself that seeing his father's street gotten wealth would inspire him to want a ball just like his daddy. I ain't gonna lie, I want to be just like him. Yeah, all the cars, all the, all the bitches, all the furs, all the clothes. I'm like, hey, I want to be just like him. Big Dirk said himself that he thought his success in the streets would never end because his operation ran like clockwork and he felt that he was always a step ahead of the police. I'm on the street 24-24. The police only on the street eight hours. There's no way they can stop what I'm doing and I control more time and more territories than they can cover. So I don't never think that it was gonna be a stopping point, not unless I got tired of doing it. However, unfortunately for Big Dirk, every good dope slang and operation eventually does have to come to an end. And soon a series of small mistakes and compromises would see the Fed swooping in on the operation, bringing Big Dirk and his associates down, as well as exposing for the whole world to see the enormous scale of the operation that he had built up. Now, public court documents actually break down the entirety of Big Dirk's operation in excruciating detail. Allegedly, Big Dirk's 24-7 dope slanging operation was entirely headed up by Dirk himself at the top of the pyramid. He was described in court papers specifically as the primary organizer of a crack cocaine empire that operated between 1991 and 1993, with it being said that Big Dirk himself would personally secure bricks of pure coke from suppliers, breaking them down and cooking them into crack in the stove of his own own personal home and breaking down the resulting rocks into many $10 dime bags. And from there, Big Dirk used underlings to create a huge operation, moving rocks around the clock, organizing workers into shifts, and making so much cash, he actually had to employ people just to count it. Beneath Dirk in his organization was his top lieutenant, Robert Ship, along with enforcers Mario Dunlop, or Dunlap, depending on which documents you're reading, and another enforcer named Alton Mills. Frankly, Dirk was running a tight operation and he hadn't expected things to come crashing down quite so quickly. But the operation would fall apart in 1993, when Big Dirk tried to delegate coke and cash exchanges to his own cushion, Tosha Woods, who ended up flipping on the gang and snitching. With that fact made even more crazy by the fact that it was revealed that she was even dating one of Dirk's enforcers, Mario Dunlop. Anywho, once the feds got wind of Big Dirk's operation, they begun to tail one of his enforcers, Alton Mills, AKA Big O. At one point, cops would try and pull him over, resulting in a high-speed chase where Big O allegedly had thrown 
thrown half a kilo of dope out of the window of the car. And one of the craziest things about this is that pack was never actually recovered by the police. Apparently they didn't really have anything on Big O. Problem is, soon after that incident occurred, the cops were then able to intercept Big Dirk on a phone call where he said several incriminating things on the very same day as that police chase where Big O had tossed half a kilo out of the car. Literally a day after that happened, Big Dirk was heard by the feds on a call saying the following incriminating things. Somebody said Big O had the candy, right? Now he's at the 61st precinct. Dirk said, what the fuck is he doing there? Somebody said, got candy? Taking that candy down there? He's only down there because he was driving crazy. Someone said, you know what I'm saying? He ate the candy. See what I'm saying? He got rid of the candy. He didn't want no more. You know what I'm saying? I'm waiting for him to get out so I can see what's up with the candy. Big Dirk says, you check on him? Somebody says they went down there. And Dirk says, is he charged with reckless driving? They said, yeah, you know what I'm saying? He could lose it. And Dirk says, who got him? Blue and white? And they say, yeah, I want to know if I can get the candy because he was the only one who knew where the candy was at so I can get it to the kids. Dirk was basically on the phone with his team the day after one of his enforcers had been picked up by the cops and thrown half a brick out the window talking about where's the candy? And unfortunately for Dirk, it didn't take Sherlock Holmes to work out what the candy they were referring to was. And apparently only four days after this unfortunate phone conversation went down, the FBI swooped in on a storage unit that Big Dirk's crew was using to store 10 bricks and a million dollars in cash. With the cops quickly charging Dirk and his associates with conspiracy to distribute cocaine, and the cops built the conspiracy case against Dirk even further, relying on the fact that after being arrested himself, he had also been heard on phone calls telling his underlings to stay in school, referring to not snitching. The court would go on to say that their drug ring had moved around 20 kilos of crack in a two year period, with alternative testimony from suppliers suggesting that around 49 kilos had been involved in the entire conspiracy, and that number would go up even further later once more information was gathered on Dirk's suppliers. But regardless of how many bricks were involved, as a result of the huge scale of this operation, Big Dirk was facing a mandatory minimum of 30 years, with him ultimately being sentenced to life in prison at the young age of 25. Big Dirk himself said that the indictment only referred to a nine month period where he had allegedly moved so much dope through the streets of Chicago that the court literally had no choice but to throw the book at him. But the bottom line word is unbelievable that you can sentence a person to life in jail. And they saying that the conspiracy that they were sentencing me to life in jail for only lasted nine months, what you gonna sentence me for? We saying that you sold so much drug in nine months that you don't need to be on the street no more. It was even reported in the news that the judge didn't even want to hand down such a harsh sentence on Dirk, but compulsory guidelines associated with crack cocaine had his hands tied. With some people going on to point out that to get the same sentence for powdered cocaine, you would have had to move to around 1500 kilos. And it's this kind of thing why people think that the drug laws unfairly punish hard dope much worse than powdered dope, with many suggesting that these rules are inherently racist, disproportionately punishing and affecting the black community community more than others. What you're seeing is that crack cocaine, one gram of crack cocaine equals, equals a hundred grams of powder. That's what they saying. Crack was much harder sentence, a much harder drug, so they sentenced you more harder for crack than they did powder cocaine. However, Big Dirk wasn't the only one in the operation to have had the book thrown at him. The Chicago Tribune reported that four dealers associated with this case were handed full-blown life sentences. Even Big Dirk's girlfriend ended up getting 10 years, but the harsh sentence delivered by the court would be made even more shameful by the fact that Dirk and his crew ended up getting snitched on by the plugs that were selling them bricks who pled guilty and turned state's witness, apparently only getting 11 and a half and eight years respectively, after admitting to the court that they had apparently sold Big Dirk a whopping 85 bricks over a two year period. 85 bricks, that is crazy. I mean, isn't that just crazy? The fact that Big Dirk's plugs were able to sell him 85 bricks and then flip on him, getting even lighter sentences than the person beneath them who they were supplying through the whole operation. It's crazy. Just goes to show you how unfair and dirty the dope game truly is. So. Big Dirk was hauled off for a life in jail, leaving Lil Dirk only a few months old with no father figure in his life. But fortunately, decades down the line, there would be a glimmer of hope as Lil Dirk would go on to make something of himself and Big Dirk would eventually get a second chance at life. If you thought that Big Dirk's time as a big dog shot caller was over when he went to jail, you'd be mistaken. Because if anything, it sounded like there was more gang activity going on in prison than in the streets. What you got in the federal system, you got everybody together because they have a coalition. You don't have no, just no one GDs, no EDs, no vice or y'all are all one up in there. However, fortunately for Big Dirk, he wouldn't be gang banging or causing violence during his time inside because apparently whilst incarcerated, he did a whole lot of reading and ended up converting to Islam. In fact, according to 
another inmate named Murder, who spent time in jail with Big Dirk, he ended up taking a leadership position in the Muslim community in prison, and was even known to press people around the jail for not carrying themselves correctly and in accordance with rules of the faith. So, and this is one thing about Big Dirk. Like, he had a lot of problems here and there with different brothers in the community. But I'm gonna tell you something, every time he had a problem with a brother, it was never over no BS. It was always over he was trying to get them to practice the religion in the way that it was supposed to be practiced. Fortunately, whilst in jail, he was regularly visited by his sons, Lil Durk and D Thang, with Lil Durk saying that he would visit his father regularly, phone him every day, and put money on his books. Uh, do you talk to him a lot? Yeah, I talk to him every day. He's straight, you know what I'm saying? I Send him letters, send him pictures, books good. You put money on his books? Yeah, I put money on all my guys' books. You could tell Big Dirk was a proud father, and he said that from the day his son Lil Dirk was born, he knew that his son was destined for greatness. And in fact, he was the only of my children out of the five children that I actually delivered personally. And I told his mom, I said, this boy here gonna be great. Well, little did he know just how right he would be. It's no secret that Lil Dirk was inspired by his father's background in the street. Lil Dirk actually told DJ Vlad that his father was caught with $8 million in cash, and seeing his father with big money motivated him to be just like him. One of your other interviews, you said that your dad was caught with like eight million dollars, six bricks. Yeah, that's why I wanted to be just like him. Said eight million, shit. From this clip, it's clear that Lil Durk was more impressed with the financial success of his father rather than the street credentials or violence of running an illegal operation. Even as a young man, Lil Durk was smart enough to realize that a life of crime wasn't the way to make and keep millions of dollars, with Lil Durk being smart enough to realize that rapping would be another way to get to that goal. So when, he, when they took him down, he got locked up. I started looking like, damn. You know, I'm young, so I'm like, I thought it was right. I just started rapping, trying to shit out, so it turned out I had B. It's funny to him now. Big Dirk himself said that he would constantly give his sons advice, telling Lil Dirk to stay out of the streets and focus on the music. I give my sons advice all the time and they listen to, you know, they take heed to the advice, you know, they soak it in. Uh, my son is not on that type of time. Uh, he's not doing those type of things. My son is on time where he's um, trying to better himself and make a living in his, um, as an artist. That's why he moved out to El um, Atlanta. So he's not on that type of time right there. Lil Durk would go on to say that his father was proud of what he achieved and described how his dad would witness his success from prison. He feel good, you know what I'm saying? He, he um, see me on BT with the This Ain't What You Want. He see me on all the magazines, um, little articles about what's going on. And as Lil Durk rose up through the ranks as a rapper, he would show love to his father in songs, referencing him and his plug snitching on him in his breakout anthem, This Ain't What You Want, as well as tweeting things about his dad, like saying that he was real for not snitching. Durk also addressed his relationship with his father in a 2017 interview on The Breakfast Club, where he claimed that the feds actually wanted Big Dirk to snitch on Larry Hoover himself. My father's been in jail 22 years. Mm -hmm. I rock with him, you know what I'm saying? Every day talk to him on the phone. I was, I was going to visit him. Mm -hmm. and, um, he had a big name in the street, so it's like he was here. They really, they ain't, they ain't even, they ain't even catch him on drugs. Though. They just, they locked him up because he ain't snitch on Larry Hoover. He, <laughs> it's, I know, it's everywhere. He used the track phones. Like, I gotta get him on point with iPhones, all types. <laughs> <laughs> and Big Dirk even appeared personally on Lil Dirk's 300 Days, 300 Nights mixtape in a jailhouse recording where he said the following. This Dirk, better known on the south side of Chicago and throughout the Midwest as Lil Dirk's father. As it started out, I had a life sentence for the stooge pigeons who told on me. I've been doing that time for 22 years now, but by the grace of Allah, I got that blessing and won the appeal. Now I'll be out in a few years to be with my boy, to be with my sons, be where I'm supposed to be in life and do the things I'm supposed to do as a father. As always, for those who's in the struggle, those who's in the system, for those who in the state system, keep your head up, keep fighting. Rats don't never win over real dudes. So keep your head up, soldier. We gonna keep on letting this thing continue to flow and we'll get out to do what we're supposed to do as men. Hold down our own and be the fathers we're supposed to be. Be the men of the community we supposed to be. Yes, in this recording, Big Dirk revealed that apparently he had won an appeal that would allow him to eventually get out of jail, avoiding serving his entire life behind bars. And Lil Dirk would elaborate on his father's life sentence being commuted in his Breakfast Club interview, saying that a rule change in Chicago law combined with an appeal meant that his father would soon be home. So what, he got life for him? Be here, life. I'm saying they passed that new rule in Chicago, that new uh, law. So he'll be home in a couple years. 
Like three. And that's exactly what happened. On February the 12th, 2019, Big Dirk is released from jail after serving around 25 years, winning an appeal that allowed him to commute his lifetime sentence and return home to his family. Lil Dirk announced the return of his pops on Twitter, saying Big Dirk home, and soon after that, posting a heartwarming photograph of him out for a meal with his fresh home father. I honestly can't imagine how amazing that moment must have felt for both Big and Lil Dirk. To have been separated from your child when they were only months old, and spending a long 25 years thinking the only outcome would be dying in prison, before suddenly everything turned around and you'd be released back to your family. I think it's a truly inspiring story, and honestly, it just goes to show you that anything is possible if you keep your hope and you keep your head held high. And even more inspiring than the fact he got out is the fact that Big Dirk, as a free man, is now doing his bit to try and help the next generation. Since his release, he's been working with the organization that I mentioned at the start of this video, Chicago Cred, putting in work as a life coach in the city of Chicago, trying to help other young men from similar backgrounds break the cycle, escaping a life of violence or crime that could leave them dead or in jail. See, a lot of people look at Big Dirt and they see a figure which they think is something to glorify, something that's famous, something that to look up to, you know. You can't look up to something like that on my past like that when I was an instrument of the destruction of my own neighborhood. Because I destroyed myself, I destroyed my community, I was destroying my people. I didn't gang bang against nobody else. I was gang bang against my own people. I owe this to myself to right a lot of the wrongs I did out there. I owe this to my community to try to rebuild back what I destroyed out there. I owe this to my people to stop them to thinking that this is a life they need to live. When Lil Dirk said that he looked up to his dad back in the day, it was because he had all the cars and all the furs, and that's one thing. But now, as Big Dirk is back out of jail, using his second chance to make up for the damage that he did to his own community, hell, I think that's even more of a great reason to look up to him. And hell, maybe he doesn't realize it, but Lil Dirk himself is one of the truest examples of just how possible it is to break the cycle. As a child, Lil Dirk witnessed his father getting a life sentence as a result of gangbanging and dope slinging in the streets. Lil Dirk made a change. He broke the cycle and became a better a man, a richer man, and a freer man than his father ever was. Big Dirk was a drug dealer who got life sentence. Lil Dirk is now a successful rap megastar who got millions of dollars. And who knows, from here, maybe Lil Dirk's children will go on to be doctors, lawyers, judges, maybe presidents. I think this is a really important story because it truly shows that sometimes it might take generations to break the cycle, but it can definitely be done. So shout out to both Dirk's Big and Lil for inspiring the next generation to do better. And shout out to Chicago Cred for the amazing work that they're doing in their community and for bringing Big Dirk's inspirational story to life with their amazing interview. Hope you enjoyed that video. I enjoyed making it and researching it. And until next time, it's your boy, Trap Law Ross. Peace. Oh, and while you're there, go subscribe to my third channel, Trap Live Ross, because your boy is streaming on Twitch now. Come tap in. Twitch.tv slash Trap Law Ross. It's lit. We're back. Thanks. Peace.